Want to advertise your business in a cost-effective way? It's time to give podcast advertising a try. Research shows a high rate of podcast listeners made a purchase as a result of an ad they heard on a podcast. Visit podbean.com slash brands to launch a cost-effective podcast advertising campaign in minutes. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com slash brands. Lady Justice is a true crime podcast, therefore deals with incidents of violence, disturbing imagery and explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. The Lady Justice podcast wishes to offer their deepest condolences to the victims' families and wishes to offer thanks to those that work in emergency services. Hello my lovelies and welcome to Lady Justice, a true crime podcast. Lady Justice is a weekly podcast that covers fascinating cases, both past and present. My name is Chantal and I'm your friendly true crime junkie with slight caffeine addiction issues. I hope everybody is doing incredibly well and have had a brilliant New Year's. As usual, before I get into this week's episode, I just want to ask you guys a favour. Please support this podcast by subscribing, rating and leaving a review where you can. And because sharing is caring, I do want you to go tell everyone you know. Share it on social media and get the word out it would make the world a difference. If you'd like to contact me about anything at all, please feel free to do so via social media or my email, which you'll find in the show notes. I am just going to say that I am completely wiped out by the flu right now, so I apologise if my voice gives out or that I just sound generally sickly. (laughs) The executioner, John Thrift, was a hated man in London, and he even carried out the last beheading in English history. Curiously, he was convicted of murder himself, yet was back to work as a hangman merely months later. So, without further ado, here's some background on the location and time frame of this crime. Hop into my little time machine as we head to the Age of Enlightenment, one of my favourite periods in history, as we pitch up in 1750. King George II was the monarch and Henry Pelham was the Prime Minister. Great Britain was still reeling after the Jacobite uprising of 1745 and everyone was rocking the wig look. Good times, eh? We are heading to London in the year that the Westminster Bridge was opened. Now, I have a question. Do you know the Muffin Man? The Muffin Man? The Muffin Man that lives on Drury Lane? Because that's the area we're focusing on today. And I'm sorry, I've got the mental age of three. (laughs) As always, all my sources will be listed in the show notes. So let's get on it like a car bonnet. John Thrift was the common executioner for London and the county of Middlesex. Not much is known about the man before he took up the role. What is known is that he was illiterate, unable to write even his own name. And he had a wife, Mary, who he married whilst he was a public servant in 1748. Thrift had begun his tenure in March 1735, taking the role from John Hopper, who was renowned for telling jokes at the gallows, and became known as the Laughing Hangman. Common executions were taking place at Tyburn, which was a small village at the time, but in modern geography, it is close to Edgware Road and the Marble Arch. Most of the prisoners that faced capital punishment were transported to Tyburn from Newgate Prison. During the 18th and 19th centuries, crime and punishments were, well, let's just say, a tad harsh. It has since been given its own nickname, being the Bloody Code, because capital punishment was used for almost 220 crimes. Some even considered as misdemeanours by 21st century standards. Stole something worth 12 pence? Yep, you were for the drop. Have you ever wrecked a fish pond? That was also punishable by death. You want to cut down that tree? Well then, you'll be for the gallows too. The use of the death penalty for petty crime was so commonplace that the gallows at Tyburn had to be replaced more than once due to wear and tear. So many would be sentenced to death that at Tyburn they built stronger gallows known as the Triple Tree, which could be used to hang 24 prisoners in one fail swoop. Phrases such as doing the Tyburn jig were the norm when talking about going to court. No one was safe, 
In fact, two of the king's executioners themselves were handed down the death penalty. Crutwell being the first, doing so for robbery, and the oddly named Stumpleg, who was hung for theft. Thrift was an incredibly anxious man who regularly seemed to be on the verge of exploding into tears whilst carrying out his duties. The first execution he administered at Tyburn was notable as he neglected to cover the faces of the 13 men who were hung. He was also the last executioner to use beheading as a technique in England. As the common executioner during the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745, he was tasked with the gruesome act of ending many lives of those known as traitors no matter their social standing. The Jacobite uprisings had the aim of returning James II of England and 7th of Scotland, the last Catholic British monarch, and later his descendants of the House of Stuart, to the throne of Great Britain, after they had been disposed by Parliament during the Glorious Revolution of 1688. In an early public execution after the rebellion, John Thrift, the executioner, wept bitterly and prayed for the forgiveness of the Jacobite rebel Lord Kilmarnock, before chopping his head off in front of a huge crowd. On the 18th of August, 1746, the Earl of Kilmarnock and Lord Balmenio, both Jacobite rebels who had taken an aggressive part in the 1745 Scottish uprising, were beheaded at Tower Hill. Thrift, whose task it was to decapitate the two men firstly fainted. When he was aroused, he was visibly upset and, in fact, as I said before, burst into tears when the first of the men, Lord Kilmarnock, arrived on the scaffold. This gave rise to the strange situation of the man who was about to die comforting and reassuring the executioner. Thrift managed to behead the Lord with one blow of the axe. Thrift then had to remove the head of the man he'd just killed and wait as his assistants replaced the sawdust that was used to soak up the blood. Lord Balmenio was even cooler than Lord Kilmarnock, when he was to stand up in front of the buzzing audience who had flocked to watch such a spectacle. The Lord picked up the axe when he descended to the platform and casually rolled his finger along the edge. This disconcerted Thrift so badly that he took three swings to take the Lord's head off. His last beheading, and that of English history, was done so on Simon Fraser, the 11th Lord Levat, on the 9th of April, 1747. Fraser had been lodged in the Tower of London and was trialled at Westminster Hall on charges of high treason due to his Jacobite ideology. It had lasted seven days, but he knew it was a foregone conclusion even before he gave his defence on the sixth day. His guilty verdict was expected, and death would be that of a traitor. He should be hung, drawn and quartered. Out of respect for Fraser, though, the king commuted his sentence to plain old beheading because that sounds so much fairer, said no one, ever. Fraser was proud of his involvement in the Jacobite Rebellion and stayed pretty damn upbeat in the days leading up to his execution. By the time the 9th of April came around, he knew that the crowds would be filling up Tower Hill and had planned to put on a bit of a show for the spectators that had come from far and wide. In those days, an execution was much like a public holiday, and made even more enticing when someone of high standing was to face the block. So many had turned up on that day, and an overcrowded timber stand collapsed and nine spectators were left dead. This left Fraser in tears of laughter. His last words were famous of Horace, Dodge et decorum est, pro patra mori, which translates as it is sweet and seemingly to die for one's country. Fraser died in his eyes as a Scottish patriot, and the axe was buried two inches deep into the block. The rest of Thrift's career was far from success. Executing Jacobite leaders didn't exactly earn him the approval of the Jacobite supporters of whom many lived in London. Wherever he went, he was greeted with abuse and cries of Jack Ketch, the brutal executioner of the previous century, who'd become famous after a particularly bad hack job and his brutal manner. Thrift had been chased down by mobs and even pelted with stones. 
and late one evening, March 11th to be exact in 1750, he was attacked by a gang of men near his home in Coal Yard, not far off Jury Lane. In order to defend himself, he ran inside and grabbed a cutlass. A cutlass was a type of naval sword that is slightly curved, and if you think pirate, that's just about right. In the brawl that followed, one of the men fell dead, and Thrift was identified by the mob as the assailant. It was a sensational tale of the time. The London hangman was now not just an executioner at the gallows, but on the street too. The full details were to come out in the courtroom when John Thrift was indicted for murder and seen at the Old Bailey Sessions on April 25th, 1750, lasting a singular day. Evidence was first given by the wife of the deceased, a Rebecca Ferris, who told of how she and her now deceased husband David Ferris and two other friends encountered the hangman he was going to go on to kill. I am the widow of the deceased. My husband, Patrick Ferrell, Timothy Garvey and myself were coming to the prisoner's door on the 11th of March between 5 and 6 in the evening. Patrick Ferrell said to the deceased, David, do you know that man, meaning the prisoner, who was standing at his own door? No, says he, I do not. I never saw him in my life to my knowledge. The prisoner's wife, sitting at the door, overheard the words and said, You pack of thieves. Suppose it is Jack Ketch. Do you want to rob him? Said Patrick Ferrell, I do not want to rob him. If I have given offence, I am sorry for it. Then the prisoner came out of his house and struck this Ferrell in the face two or three times with his fist. He was not satisfied with that, but he went back, pulled off his coat, hat and wig and was then in a flannel waistcoat without sleeves. He went in and fetched a cutlass, drawed it, delivered the scabbard to his wife and pursued the three men, who were then got on the head of Cole Yard, Drury Lane. David Ferris turned around, saw him coming, on which they three ran. He pursued them across Drury Lane, into the archway going under Short's garden. As the deceased ran forward, the prisoner struck him on the left side of his head, but he held up his stick and kept off several blows from his head, till his foot slipped in the dung. Then he fell down and the prisoner gave him several cuts, but where I cannot tell. The other man who was confined with the prisoner, Enoch Stock, upon my crying out to my husband was killed, made a blow at me with a stick, which hit the infant in my arms and stunned it. My husband died on the 19th of March. Other witnesses testified to a different story, however. Some of the onlookers of the many that had gathered around when the fight broke out gave evidence that suggested there may be a different motive for the outbreak of violence. A Thomas Clutton had told the court, About five o'clock, I was sitting at the nine-pin house door, the time these three men and one woman was going by the door. I heard this last witness, that being Patrick Ferrell, call the prisoner's wife whore several times, an eternal whore, after which the prisoner came out of his house and said, What do you want to rob the house? There were reports at the time that there had been an angry mob that had chased Thrift down, screaming Jacobite slogans, though this has never been mentioned in the court transcripts. Thrift did give testimony in his defence, stating to the justice, I did not give the blow. Enoch Stock did take the hanger out of my hand and cut this man, the deceased. He did go on to explain that he had been to church that day and upon his departure, the four in question began to torment him in an attempt to get into a quarrel. He told of how he had grabbed his cutlass in his defence, but it was still in its protective covering when he went to give chase. Some of his story was collaborated. Patient Jones, one of the women on the street at the time, said that she had heard the men with sticks who were following thrift say that they were going to knock the man's brains out. Now, Enoch Stock, that's been mentioned, was a long-term acquaintance of Thrift, and he was involved in the fight as Thrift's friend. Enoch Stock had no way to deny if he had in fact landed the fatal blow that was to go on to kill David Ferris, eight days later in the hospital. 
Stock had been stunned during the melee in the Short's gardens and was unable to remember and originally admitted that he was the murderer. A surgeon was called before the court who said that Ferris himself, although without the use of his right side of his body, had indicated via sign language that it was Thrift. It was a damning consensus that Thrift was the one that had killed the man. The final damning testimonies given against Thrift at his trial were by two witnesses out of the masses that had surrounded them as they fought. Philip Listall described, I was sitting at my own door at the time, facing the green man. I saw the prisoner in a white waistcoat and had a cutlass in his hand. Follow these people into Drury Lane. He overtook them at a gateway, and there I saw him take three cuts at the man that is dead. There was another man, named Ferrell, with the deceased, with a white coat on and a stick in his hand. There was a great crowd of people. I saw Ferrell making strokes at a little man who was there. The prisoner had first a blow at the deceased's arm, which falling, he then got a blow on his head. I saw the prisoner coming back again, and a man along with him all bleedy. He said he had been besieged, and he was sorry that he had not cut one of their heads off. And he did actually say bleedy in testimony, which I think is brilliant. Finally, William Carrier endorsed this. I saw the prisoner, Thrift, at this time strike the deceased one blow on the left side of the head with a hanger. I was about five yards distance and lived directly opposite him. He was in a flannel waistcoat without sleeves. The executioner didn't have to wait long for his verdict of guilty and was sentenced to death. But his sentence was reduced to one of transportation to the American colonies. However, the city corporation realised that the hangman was too valuable a man to lose and so gained a free pardon on the 14th of September 1750 on condition that he resumed his trade. And that's exactly what he did. He carried on being the public executioner. The stresses and difficulties of Thrift's career and celebrity status proved too much for him, and on the 5th of May 1752, he died after a short illness. He'd been the county executioner for 18 years. Even death produced no peace for John Thrift, for no funeral could have been more turbulent. The mobs assembled, offal and brickbats were flung at the undertaker's men, and reported in newspapers at the time. It appeared as if the body itself was going to be dragged out of the coffin. After some time, harmony was restored and John Thrift, hangman and beheader, was laid to rest in the churchyard of St Paul's in Convent Garden. So that, my friends, is the end of the tale of the executioner. And I think it's about time to balance out those scares a little by doing a small act of kindness for someone else. When it comes to donating your old items, the possibilities are endless. Charities are willing to accept anything from clothes and shoes to books, furniture and other household items. The best part, you'll be helping out others whilst making room in your house for all those things you got for Christmas. So with that, go be good people, go be kind, go be safe and most importantly, go be happy.